And I'm really honored to have all these gentlemen here at Immerse. I'm honored, of course, for all our speakers. Um, however, this is a futurist panel, and, and much, much of what we're doing in this industry is, is based on the contributions of, of many of these individuals. Um, first off to my immediate right is John Gaeta, Creative Director of New Experiences, excuse me, New Technology and Experiences. I hope I got that right on my way off. New media, excuse me, new media experience. I always get that mixed up. My apologies. But uh, one thing I'm not mixed up on is uh, he is Academy Award winner uh, for the Beatrice Trilogy, for the Bullet Time, as well as special effects. So of course it's an honor to have him here. Uh, David Tro, he was uh, the main uh, virtual reality consultant for the Lawnmower Man, and he also did all the CG, gra CG graphics and all the computers in, in, in the film. So we always quote Lawnmower Man reality is being a motivator for us. Um, so he was, of course, very key in that. To his immediate right is, is Neil Trevitt, who, who we've heard from earlier today, president of the Kronos Group, responsible for many of the key standards uh, that drive our devices. Um, and also he's VP of the mobile ecosystem for NVIDIA. And finally, uh, Professor Michael Page, who's been a bit of a, a social celebrity, uh, partially because of his holography work and also you know, exposing certain things in the industry. So we have quite a mix today. So, um, so first off, uh, you know, if I could share a senior with you, John, is The Matrix is regularly credited as a movie that motivated people to be interested in VR. But I, I'm struck that the whole story of The Matrix was about people not wanting to be in VR. They wanted to break out the, <laughs> off the chains and, and you know, get into real life. So what, where is the, the misconnect between positive virtual reality and people trying to escape this virtual world in The Matrix? Uh, you're, you're right about that. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a tale of warning and everything else. Um, and it's a, uh, you know, it's an example of um, the imagination of artists being, and, and uh, futurists, I suppose, to, to predict of a path that could be taken, um, not necessarily the path that we're on. And I'm not sure if folks, I'm not sure if folks, you know, look at the Matrix trilogy as something that any of us are aspiring in any way. Uh, they just, um, I suppose, at the time of their lives, they were stimulated in thinking that there was plausible to have an alternate reality and have an identity inside and all of those sorts of fundamental things and that it could be so um, sublime and powerful that you could um, not even know you were inside. So I think that is a possibility for sure, but it's certainly not something we want any to Now, if I can ask David, you're in a similar scenario because the lawnmower man regularly credited as being a big motivator for the vision of VR. I mean, you yourself, I think, are the main consultant for virtual reality. And I'll, and you'll forgive my sense of humor. Um, I'll never forget, I was re-watching the movie to, to, to prepare, and there's this golden scene where, okay, so maybe I should, first, by a show of hands, how many of you have seen the movie The Lawn Man? Okay, alright, okay, so maybe you don't know the scene I'm going to talk about. So for those who haven't, uh, the, the premise of the movie is that uh, this character named Joe is, is uh, limited. Like, he's just, he's just de deficient. Uh, intellectually, and it's been holding his life back. Um, and Pierce Brosnan, who's this doctor who's working in virtual reality, uh, has this method that using virtual reality, he can make people smarter. So he uses these treatments on Joe, and Joe becomes smarter and smarter and smarter to, until, he, until the monster's proportions. But here's the scene, which, which I distinctly remember, was Joe was sitting down in, in, in Pierce Brosnan's home, and he's wearing the head mounted display. And, and Joe is saying to Pierce Brosnan when he's at his, his brightest, he says that virtual reality is going to be like the telephone was to the telegraph. Do you remember that scene? 
And then, with perfect timing, Pierce Brosnan says, Joe, you're having a mental break. <laughs> and we're, lit, we're in this time now where there's obviously a lot of enthusiasm for virtual reality and a lot of excitement for, for, for these devices. You know, at what point is it hype and at what point is it sincere, you know, I shouldn't say sincere, but, but an accurate representation of where the industry is headed? Before I answer that, because I'm having a mental break, I just want to say that I had an epiphany about, about Bulletin, the effect. That's the first time we were all introduced to 3D without glasses. That was an amazing experience. Um, so let's talk about long one again. Uh, it's a cautionary tale. The idea was to show where things could go wrong if you introduce technology that can impact humans and change or rather evolve their cognitive perception and capacity irresponsibly. And um, I think the, the analogy of the telegraph to the telephone, it was likened to the ability to be talking versus be able to be fully present in another reality. It wasn't really uh, it wasn't really invoking the fact that there was any specific content involved. And I just think that um, the way the brain works, and, and this is you know, my main point, we're all struggling. We started doing virtual reality stuff back in the, I guess it was sort of the late 80s. We're all really struggling here even now with AR, just to get back to where we already are, right? We already see in 3D, we're already immersive, et cetera, et cetera. But what people want is the ability to articulate an experience and share a fantasy, if it's just in terms of, of entertainment. I also concur earlier today that the reality, that most of the applications of the value really comes in in being able to, to see and immerse yourself in a, a, a uh, repair manual when you're driving a caterpillar and something breaks down. There's a lot of industrial value. But the real issue is who's producing the content? How um, accurate, or rather, how compelling is it? And what's their intent? Technology is not a good nor evil. It's how you use it. And to the extent to which people can experience and share experiences that give them a suspension of disbelief, and if it is the escape that they want, to experience that escape, and maybe by the process of identification, learn something by the epiphany of that character, that's a wonderful thing. And by the way, I'm first and foremost a mental health educator who chooses entertainment as my delivery system for, for education, so I think it's an indicator. Now, having said that, there was a very interesting interview recently with um, the producer for Interstellar, said I'm really going out of my way not to be communicating my mores or my goals, but just to give it the worst of experience, but that's BS. And we all communicate our values. So really the issue of whether or not the long arm man, or rather Joe's became evil or not, had much to do with the nature of his own torment and childhood, from my perspective, as it would from anything that came out of the content, which was really, I guess, if you might, academically, designed to accelerate the acquisition of new knowledge and to embed it in a manner where that learning becomes part of the process. That was all one night. <laughs> <laughs> says, some people have a way with words and some people not have a way. <laughs> I'm certainly the latter, but I'm thinking it. So if, if uh, Joe was sitting in your chair and he, and he said virtual reality is to the, to look, if virtual reality is like the telegraph to the telephone, would you have told him that he's having a mental break? Absolutely not. But what I would say is it's certainly uh, a telephone to smoke signals when it comes to entertainment and certain types of experiences in educational environments. But I completely agree, and this is all more clear here, and I want to thank you for inviting me, that augmented reality is an exponentially larger opportunity. And in fact, uh, I was with uh, a Chinese billionaire a couple of weeks ago, who pulled out some glasses, he's got about 150 it's full of some glasses with a CPU in it and a SIM card in it and a little CPU watch. I mean, he had a watch 
said so people will not be using phones in 15 years. Maybe it's 20 years. But I really do believe that augmented reality uh, is really just accelerating our reintegration into itself with the addition of content generated from external sources from the additional locations given to us what we need just in time. So I think augmented reality is even more interesting. But what is reality but that which we mediate all the time as an educator, my interest is finding ways to optimize learning so that young people can have all the chance and all the tools and skills they can have in the future. And what better to do that than to recreate the reality that they mediate to do so with what's called a suspension of disbelief. So they're not looking for the camera angles, they're not looking at the microphone, they're processing that data as if it were primary. And that's the beauty and the power of a virtual reality expression. If it's high resolution and it has enough capacity to replicate reality so you can get that first person engagement with that data that's real, I'm not sure I was still answering the question. My dad was a lawyer, it's obvious. I'm a trained lawyer. <laughs> so we're in this space now where there's, I mean, I'm just using virtual reality as an example. I mean, there's augmented reality as well, of course. We're seeing all kinds of devices just in our exhibit hall. We're seeing all kinds of innovations, uh, prototypes, and so on. So, Neil, uh, my next question would be for you. I mean, you, you run, of course, the president of the Kronos Group. Is it time to standardize devices like this? I mean, like, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? My first thought is, uh -oh, I'm, I'm boring with all these kind of movies and programs. I'm doing really standards. <laughs> <laughs> but um, actually, as we, as we build the future, the standards are really good. And actually, they're not boring at all. They're, they're the essential life of the future plan uh, uh, to be. And, uh, but there are lots of mis misconceptions about standards. I mean, that they're slow, they're boring, um, they can be restricted, um, they call back innovation, you know, they can be used their IP in horrible ways. But actually, you know, well designed standards are the complete opposite. A well designed standard, a timely standard, is essentially letting two communities communicate to each other. And you can have multiple parallel communities in the industry. Innovating in their own brains, agreeing through standard protocols how to talk to each other, and you can accelerate how you choose for it. And virtual reality and augmented reality, they're going to be a constellation of different standards. Um, you know, the Chronos group, we do one thing that's how the software developers talk to the silicon, looking at going to be applications, talking to cloud services, going to be uh, VR apps, and download the standard formats. Because if we have no standards there, it's going to be chaos. It's going to be a million times. So, um, but we mustn't standardize too soon because um, the final point can actually be a very effective one. And multiple viewpoints coming in. What was that that you were talking about? An idea to make it really suitable for the industry. But um, design like it, even worse, search like it, the nightmare. We don't want to do that. So uh, when ideas are born enough, but people really know what they want to do, they want to start communicating with other members of the ecosystem, that's the time we need to understand. Because there are some parts of the ecosystem that are ready, but there are definitely parts that are not quite ready. Okay. So Michael, I think actually you know, this ties into other parts of this conversation, is responsibility. And uh, I mean, you, you were a professor at OCAD U, a visiting professor at the University of Toronto, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you probably see all kinds of stuff on the market, you know, in, in the immersive space. We've seen obviously a lot of excitement in, in VR around Oculus and Sony and Virgin Borelia and so on. But are, are we starting to see examples of, of uh, tomfoolery that, uh, you know, be irresponsible people taking advantage of what's going on? Well, thanks to our filmmaker friends here who have represented holographic video in science fiction again and again, that the public has come to expect something that is, for all intents and purposes, a physical possibility. So we don't know how to make photons go into the center of the room here and suddenly change the direction of what we call these people and describe either point cloud or some other. Image. 
So that there has to be some medium of some kind. And so we've seen, and, and Neil and I have been exchanging uh, thoughts about uh, the Indiegogo campaign that's, that's recently that we should all have received, um, that you know, basically proposes to break these laws of, of physics. Um, I think the future, it, to understand the distinction between how holographic video might work and how uh, 3D cinema works, the world, if you folks are watching Avatar, you're getting the same stereo pair over there as you are over there. And in a holographic scenario, what we're talking about is you're getting up, and you've just seen the, uh, the guy score in the hockey game, but your view is obstructed, so you could have to go over there and watch the unobstructed view. So this, uh, this notion of having uh, reams and reams of data that somehow is communicated over the internet has, has been suggested again and again. Um, doesn't make any sense to any of us, but then talking to people on the internet 10 years ago didn't make sense either. And certainly seeing your loved ones on the, on the screen as well as it is uh, an impossibility 10 years ago. So, I think, you know, the folks at MIT that are doing a bang up job of this uh, have made some really, really smart decisions. They put away their supercomputers and started using massively parallel GPUs, gaming cards, essentially. Um, <laughs> they started saying, well, you know, in a single user scenario, we can start just computing the fringes of the, the information that where the guy's looking, if we can track his head, that's even better. We can reduce the amount of and the problem remains that they can generate the data, and there's a spatial light modulator that can do this, but getting the data from the computer to the spatial light modulator is problematic. So, will someone in the next decade produce a uh, carbon nanotube that's reactive, that, you know, is controlled with, uh, uh, we're seeing the move now to more and more coherent optics, so we had LCDs, and LED flat screens, and then we have OLED flat screens, which we heard about earlier, which are transparent and have all kinds of uh, fantastic possibilities for generating dimensional information. Um, my guess is that the future of holographic video will be uh, a hybrid of what we now know as holography and other technologies. And uh, that these technologies will be developed not because of holography, but because we need coherent light, spatial light modulators to speed up the internet. So the people who do that work will to solve this problem very well. So I want to talk about standards, but not the standards that necessarily Neil brought up, because what Neil brought up are standards of passing content to all devices. But you know, we're talking about you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, you know, literally giving content almost directly to our brain. Do we, so what, uh, actually, uh, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask John, I'll start with John, actually. I mean, looking at the matrix and, and how, how the characters were so close to life, and, you know, it's all, life is a series of inputs. Do, do we have to look at VR from a, from a responsible point of view? Like, what, what are your thoughts on this? Absolutely, without a doubt. I'm, uh, I don't think, here, but I, there, we're wandering into an unknown frontier without a doubt. We, we see um, the impact of immersion um, on people, the most simple experiences, pragmatic, uh, emotional responses. Um, <coughs> It's very difficult to, to know what, what's very what's very different about this is, is you know in the same way that any uh, person's physiology seems to respond differently to anything put inside their body. Uh, one would want to just assume that you know, the emotional content that you're putting in to you know a degree of realism that presence or is potentially going to happen on a case-by-case -case basis. And in, insofar as, I don't, the, the thing about this that's tricky is 
that, um, I mean, every person here is here because of the uh, potential, the optimistic, the positive, I'm hoping, I assume so, right? You're all here because you believe that whether it's enlightenment or education or inspiration or imagination, there's a potential of expanding the human experience in a, in a way we haven't seen before. But we probably uh, all have the uh, capacity to understand that there, well, one, we could accidentally damage people. So we need to be careful about that. And the advantage of the time that we're in right now is that we can clearly uh, put it out there that there will probably be paths that are dark and damaging and that we need to figure out how to know what those are. And we also have to figure out how to allow people to make choices. So, you know, yeah, talk to Neil as well about this, you know, when we're talking about, uh, I mean, for anyone who is like, uh, you know, experienced the last Crescent Bay uh, demos, and you're like, oh, that seems to be the first example of presence, actually. You know, prior, you know, prior uh, versions of the technology seem to be, you know, pointing towards something that they are interesting, but um, once they got it up to that kind of uh, frame, all of a sudden we started feeling something almost physiological. And that's with almost no subject matter to look at, with almost nothing emotional to look at. It is it's already getting to a place. So I think it's uh, important that, uh, you know, as an adult, I can make a choice. You know, I'm an adult, I can make a choice to do anything I want. I can take a drink, I can take a prescription drug, but, um, you know, that's because um, it's my choice, you know, being mature enough to make it. I think people need to um, back to that when the years come. Well, actually, let me, let me ask a question. We're in, we're in a world now, there's lots of immersive devices out there. Um, what, what would you recommend to content makers you know, to take these responsibilities into account? Like, do you have some key ideas on, on what would be considered, you know, safe content until we, until we know more? Well, I'm not sure. I think that if we're going to go into the unknown, we're going to scratch that edge. But for me personally, I'm going to try to uh, stay focused on imagination and creativity. Um, I'm, uh, you know, as a as a as a storyteller, um, you know, not all stories have blissfully optimistic arcs. Of course, you you need to have arcs. You have to have peaks and valleys in order for there to be you know compelling stories to tell. So. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to see. Um, I can't. I can't really uh, say what other people should do, but I. I know what I'm going to do is. Um, is to go gently, uh, but very mercifully. Well, David, I mean, I think you're. I'm gonna try to keep my thoughts on my seven-year-old brain and share it with you. Number one, I made the quote earlier. Technology is not the good or evil, that's how you use it. Number two, I would bet anybody here, uh, just to be safe, that 95% of the young people that go out and shoot their classmates are hardcore gamers. There are, so they've, they've, they've scenarioed it. Um, there's 10 million video game addicts in China alone, probably 5 million in Korea, uh, and it's, it's a real problem over there that literally uh, don't allow them to play. They have the camps where they re-educate people. Uh, I am a media producer, been producing for 30 years across all the media, and my seven-year-old son has never seen a television except for at Best Buy, one that experienced the overdose. The reason being is the mind goes through about seven stages of learning by the time they're ten, and two-thirds of them before they're seven. And to rob the child of their natural 
uh, movement towards narrative form, imagination, character, etc., etc., and to insert themes and metaphors and rapid editing before they have a chance to generate creation of their own, I think it's not my innovation, but I do like research. Uh, I think it's a little bit unfair uh, if you're in that business. As an educator, going to that question, what would you do? I'd like your answer about imagination. I am literally a biopsychosocial literacy uh, educator at a master's in that space using entertainment. And my choice is to choose movies, projects. I don't do movies, I do transmedia platforms that have movies in them, drive it, the creation of the brand and the characters that facilitates the waterfall of projects. I choose projects that will teach uh, children of all ages certain things. Like my last one was a Steve Jobs film. That was taking risks, believing in yourself, being different. Uh, I wasn't trying to teach people to be a jerk. I knew him for a number of years, but that's just, again, me having humor to rest. I say things without controlling myself, always in search of that laugh. It's better than animal to rest. Sorry, that was a problem. Um, but the most important thing that we can do in order to protect people is not necessarily to focus on what we produce. Um, unfortunately, most people are not like John, who operates at a meta level across all the different job functions and platforms. Most people are the people that say, I can split it out. I can create a trigger. They don't think about the fact that together it creates a nuclear weapon and will kill 80,000 people in five minutes. So the point being is that we have to inoculate young people in a manner that doesn't happen. We have to teach literacy. In this case, we have to teach mental health literacy, media literacy, etc. I don't know about Canada, but in the United States, there's one council for every 479 students. <clears throat> in California, there's 1,000 students at the council. 8% of the time, maximum goes to the kids. Half that is job counseling, half that is work counseling. There is no mental health education. There's nothing that teaches the kids why they're in school, that they're intelligent, that their dreams are valuable, why their parents fight, why they join gangs or kill, and why video games are so compelling and interesting, but also potentially dangerous. They don't understand that. The last point I want to make, because this is not all I can remember inside, is that I heard something the other day really passionately arguing for the literacy that video games and immersive experiences do deliver. And that there are there are means and narrative structures and grammars and methodologies that we said a couple panels earlier that enable our children to compete in the 22nd century, to not have to learn certain grammars and to be able to paint in a palette that we can't even contemplate. And I just, frankly, am a Darwinist, and I'm very spiritual and I'm religious, so I think everything happens for a reason. I believe that we're all here and we just need to focus on doing our best to realize our purpose and do the best that we can to try to educate people early, give them the tools so they can interpret and make choices as young and as early as possible. The last thing that I will remember, very scary, uh, I, 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 I've been involved in a platform that teaches people how to make win-win report and, and uh, conflict resolution. One of the elements he uses is NLP. And one of the guys that took it said, this is fascinating because the CIA, the CIA teaches people exactly how to do the opposite. To use <coughs> language and grammar to confuse people and obfuscate you know, their true expression. And that points to the evil. It's not the technology. It's how people choose to use technology it can create compelling realities which can seduce and deploy and employ people in service to the wrong values. People need to be able to filter prejudice and discretion and volition. They need to be able to be literacy. I think literacy is the most powerful thing we can do as a standard requirement in schools for young people. Okay. Virtual reality. Virtual reality, absolutely. Probably more so than anywhere. Because it replicates reality, and of course, very important. So just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Nicole. I'm sorry, I don't agree. I think we need to be careful because presence, I think, could be a very powerful force. And I have a position here until about six 
months ago, I wasn't a believer. But I have become a believer because I've seen a few things. I've, I've actually experienced the presence for the first time. I'm actually how many people here who have a personal experience presence in the VR experience. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's, it, it is a transformative thing. And, and actually, if you look back through the history, one of the first um, applications of VR was an application that was at the original pit lab in Washington State, where yeah, it was uh, children being treated for bad burns, and it was a very you know, uh, clinical experience, and they used it one of the first VR systems to give the kids presence. And they physiologically measured and proved that by putting them into this VR system, they were removed into a different presence and really helped with that. So I think it is going to be, I'm overconfident that the presence is going to be a thing. And I think that, um, in the video, a lot in the video game industry. And I think if you look at you know, the stable of video games, the first person shooter, um, Call of Duty, etc. If presence does turn out to be a thing, you don't have to be really careful. It's big enough for people in situations and they experience presence in that situation. You could get PTSD. You could physically get PTSD, perhaps. I it's my knowledge is practice, yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, you have to be careful because there could be some unforeseen consequences. But what, what's also interesting, though, is conversely, you know, there's a um, it could actually enable people to transcend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I can't recall the author's name, but there's an author who came up once who, who talks a lot about this thing called flow states. Chimela. And it's, it's basically, it's yeah, it's about basically people who, who achieve the highest of all human achievements in sport, particular shows. Right, and they have flow. Right? And so there is, it makes you wonder if you can sort of trick the mind, if you will, or at least lead the mind into certain flow states that unlock certain potential in people. And it's and this could conversely, you know, unleash very, very positive things in people. So it's, it's equal measure. Uh, it's you know, so I'm like not really I, you know, to be really grown up about it, we need to know that the, both of those paths are out there. And you can't allow uh, this sort of dirty path to materialize from a commercial, you know, just from a, it will come from commercial, low hanging fruit uh, uh, types of uh, sensibilities and parts. But, um, but that could not only destroy the industry as an industry, but it also this is Neil's question for you. What kinds of standards? Should there be regulations or even age restrictions when it comes to material that models violent behavior in the way it's so powerful that they become better behaviors? Well, that's not the kind of standards I'm giving, so I'm not really going to ask that. Yeah, yeah. 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 yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 There's a right organization about it. Yeah, I think society's going to need to look at this. It's going to be a mixture of um, self-regulation, but I think this could potentially be a powerful technology that we're going to have some regulation. So I just have two questions, for, one for Neil, one for Michael, and I really think the audience should have the opportunity to ask questions here as well, but I think we can go to time. Um, so Neil, I mean, this is a futurist panel, and of the futurist, I have seen you as a builder. I mean, you build the architecture to make these, you know, these ideas and these dreams a reality. So, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're still prototyping the industry, still building, still learning. As a builder, what steps, what would you like to see happen within the next 10 years to, you know, for a long-term, you know, viability and, and, a, and a growing industry? Good question. So, I think, for the VR country that you all imagine, um, there's, there's a big online of problems or opportunities for the industry uh, to solve. And some of them, I think you can rely on uh, familiar old engines and more so it's going to solve some of them. We've got some processing power issues and power consumption issues. Uh, we need 
speed up the focus time. That would be the underlying engine that propels us down the path to solutions at the time. I think there are other, um, much less um, troubling paths where it's not obvious where the solutions are going to come from. There's going to be some big breakthroughs. But that's the, they're the interesting areas to, kind of, to monitor. I mean, actually, one of the perhaps most fundamental is how do we actually get stuff into the optic mode? You know, how are we going to uh, drive displays that are truly immersive? And um, what I was saying earlier, we earlier have, you know, there's opportunities and great products all the way along, so it's not to sort of throw us down. But in the end, I think having flat panel displays bolted to your face is not going to be the way to do it. Um, it's better. We need light for the displays. We need to be able to focus naturally on different objects. Distances from it, and um, there are some very fetching technologies. The videos were from the sun, as I was mentioned earlier, that is a direct laser retina scan display that does have the room it is, it has my grid properties, so you can generate very realistic uh, imagery. I think that is the kind of area that very few people see. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to be the one or whether it's going to be something else like it, but that, that's a way of a real great reason. Well, Michael, I, I hope I'm reading correctly, but I think you devoted a large portion of your career to holography. I mean, uh, in education, in research, development. I hope I'm correct. So far, so good. Yes? Okay. 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 Perfect. So, I think what you're doing is you know, and, and your enthusiasm for this ties into virtual reality and cognitive reality because it's something that you're reaching out for, something to achieve in, in the immersive space. So, my question to you is, why? Like what, and, 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 and the answer, I think, is very important because I think it speaks to why the virtual reality, why cognitive reality, because it's, it's just, the holography is a constant work in progress. That's my opinion. Yeah, I think um, you know, most of the virtual reality we're looking at is cinematic. Uh, I, you know, we've seen examples today of holograms that are virtually indistinguishable from the objects that they were used to import from. And uh, I think that, you know, holography is, is very, very high in, in, uh, in the VR experience. It's a thing that has more of the 16 cues, digital cues to the brain that say, Neil, you're real and you're not a hologram. So when you talk about immersive environments and those objects in the immersive environment are virtually distinguishable from real objects, then I think you're really going to have to watch out for mental illness and other types of things in, uh, in people's responses to that. So I don't know how far, you know, what kind of art my contribution has been around sort of interactive holograms. Um, I don't know how far uh, it will be smarter than that. That, but uh, how far it will go in terms of an immersive environment that's interactive? Again, it's really hard to predict that future. But um, there are lots of people thinking about it. It's what the public wants, it's what they've been told is going to happen, and they're not going to let up until they get it. Very good. So I would really like, I mean, I, I hope you're up to it, but uh, I welcome you to ask our, our panelists questions. Is there a hand mic in the audience? No? Yes, maybe, uh, does anyone wish to ask our panelists any questions? Just raise your hands and we'll get a mic to you.
a different level of experience. You actually believe that these are the subconscious level. Even if you know you're sitting in a chair and you're not actually in a kind of fire fight, your subconscious actually doesn't really count. Now, I've, I've experienced just like standing on a high edge. That's a much simpler scenario than a battle situation. I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows whether a presence can be sustained through that complexity of experience. But, but you know, the, the hypothesis is if it could be, um, then it's a really powerful tool. Uh, it would not be my question, it really would be my question, saying it by the time, go and see, it would be my demon, and that would be the other. And it you know, has to lock the, the possibility of reaching the demon. I think it's cool, I think it's very interesting to get there. I believe that we're all trying to get there, personally. But yeah, definitely after that is how uh, like, we're always going to do about this communication as well. Go out and try the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, product as you walk in. As it's a meditation program. And it's on a beautiful, watery, Caribbean shore somewhere. And uh, I actually felt a little bit last week, but I'm a little, little sea snake, you know, I don't know what. But um, I really, actually, it's really beautiful. And I think that, uh, you know, again, there's so many wonderful things that technology can do. I live my life because of technology. And um, it's really just how we use it. The presence, the ability to be fully present in the now, without lots of noise inside. It's not so much about the technology, it's your ability to accept and become one with whatever the data is that you're processing. And there's nothing too shabby about a gorgeous Mediterranean beach. Well, I'll try to demo the other Yeah, I just, I try it as well. That's all the same. That's very interesting. So, you know, we all talk about how the content itself is the one that we need to um, pay attention to in terms of um, ensuring that we are creating experiences that are beneficial for everyone. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the back end part, which is um, uh, has to do with the fact that you know Facebook has bought Oculus, Google has bought Magic Leap. So there's a whole other side of VR, which is the sort of economic infrastructure that is starting to um, be developed today, um, which could very well follow the same sort of economic infrastructure that we've seen on the internet, which is highly um, uh, invasive in terms of privacy, um, using data as the, this, as the dominant monetization element for many of these experiences. Um, so how do you guys think that that particular part of the VR industry is going to uh, evolve in terms of your futurist ideas? Uh, oh, okay. Well, um, here's what I'm wondering. Well, it depends on where you are in the world, I suppose. Uh, here's what I'm hoping, my optimistic hope for the United States is that um, at a certain point, um, when people are aware enough of the fact that they are, um, they've lost their anonymity in all ways and their privacy in all ways, that at a certain point there will be a flip. And because of the nature of the United States, uh, I think that the free market may dictate that privacy has a great value and that there is the possibility that um, providing anonymity is profitable. I'm just my, my idealistic. Oh, yeah. So what I would like to see, <laughs> what I wonder about, you know, with companies like Google and Facebook is that they realize this and they basically essentially construct a mirror of themselves, sort of like the tour approach, right? That basically it's impossible to know. This is what I would like to see happen. And I don't think it's um, a foregone conclusion. Because I don't think the guys who started Google ever intended when they started to end up being Big Brother. I don't think at all they wanted to do that. And so I wonder, and I hope, you know, inside themselves that they, at some point this would matter to them. And uh, I think that where they have gone is 
because they wanted to create a sort of like an incredibly fluid and intelligent system. <laughs> yes, that made money and was commercially, um, you know, uh, viable, but but I don't think that they realized that the privacy issue um, would become so severe until we, you know the last couple of years of Snowden and all of that. So what I'm hoping is that we basically see them at some point convert themselves in a way that people that Good news is, I was in China a few weeks ago, and she no longer work. The reason is because the guys are building a compromise and kowtow to the Chinese administration. And they are our generation, or actually younger than us. And Google and Facebook are both pretty conscious companies from my observation, although you know, they've, they've hired a lot of location salespeople. But I do think that in the end, they do follow the public opinion as much as they can. And I know that the uh, phone companies recently stopped uh, by default tracking people, or at least they said that. Uh, so it really just comes down to people coming up and, and communicating. The only people that are going to determine what our future is is us, the power of the crowd. And I believe that's the most fabulous and virtual thing that's emerging of all of us. Is the more these tools allow us to talk to each other and convene and communicate how we feel, the more we become a force that will force vendors to comply if they want us to play, as long as people are fully aware of, of what's actually being compromised in terms of our rights. The net is one thing. Communication can be used to gather information, it can be used to find back. Um, but I think this is going to be an issue. Being, um, these devices are going to be equipped with cameras and glass against us at the very, very first ripple of the home and showing what that kind of means. Face recognition is coming from our world through the neutral decree right now, but that's going to happen too. It's being invented. It's going to happen. And so um, the best solution I've come up with and my recommendation for all is to invest in full snow companies. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you change the shape of the face. <laughs>